H.W. Crocker III, why a book on Robert E. Lee and leadership? Uh, there have been many books written about Robert E. Lee, but I thought it was time to write a practical one that people could actually use. Um, this book intends to tell Robert E. Lee's story with all the storm and controversy that surrounded, all the tragedy that surrounded it, the blood and thunder of combat of the four years of the Civil War, which he's most famous for. Um, but also to make it a book that you could actually take and apply to your life. Uh, Robert E. Lee himself believed in the power of emulation. He believed you could study the lives of great men and learn something from them, not in the academic way, but in a way that you would actually apply to your own life. Um, for example, Robert E. Lee, his father, Lighthouse Harry Lee, had served under George Washington during the Revolutionary War, and Lee idolized Washington as an American. He even married into Washington's family. Um, as a soldier, he admired Napoleon, so he Napoleon's campaigns very thoroughly. Um, and as a Christian, he attempted as all sincere Christians to the imitation of Christ, very, very sincerely. Um, and I think for those of us who admire Robert E. Lee as a man, um, we too can, can learn from him. We can actually emulate and employ both the principles he consciously held, but also those that we can extract from his actions, actions in the field of combat, actions as an educator after the war at what was then Washington College, what is now Washington Lee University. And he, he was also superintendent at West Point. So he had a, he had a, um, he was in a, a versatile man in some ways. He was also a, a businessman, a, a plantation operator for a small time. When did you first uh, become aware of Robert E. Lee? Um, long time. I mean, I've always admired Robert E. Lee. Um, I am originally, however, from California. It wasn't really until I moved back here that I really got deeply, deeply interested in, uh, in Robert E. Lee. And one of the interesting experiences for me in writing this book was I went into the book obviously admiring the man, but contrary to what you might expect, after learning everything I could about him, I didn't find myself focusing now on the feet of clay. I didn't find myself marveling at his small flaws. I found myself admiring him even more than when I began. Um, and I do consciously think, both in my personal life, my family life, my business life, I find myself asking the question, what would Robert E. Lee do? And I do think he is a, a beacon for people who are seeking to do the right thing. Um, a friend of mine, a, a Mississippi-born journalist named Charlotte Hayes, once told me that um, Robert E. Lee was the finest man the North American continent ever brought forth. She actually told me this when I told her I was writing this book. And I thought at that point that was obviously a little bit hyperbolic. Um, but frankly, at the end of the day, after I'd finished the book, I started thinking that was true. Uh, I cannot think, personally, of a better exemplar of sort of mature leadership, of someone who shows us not only how to um, advocate useful principles, but someone who actually live them. It's very easy to give lip service, even well-meaning lip, lip service, to high-minded ideals, but Robert E. Lee lived it and even paid the price for it in, um, in some of the sadder parts of his life. What price? Well, the price of having sided with Virginia during, um, during the war. He lost everything. He lost his home. He lost his investments. One of his children died during the war with two grandchildren. Um, he lost countless friends uh, and saw the state that he valued among all other loyalties devastated by the war. Um, his region, the South, I mean, completely destroyed. A quarter of the draft age men, white males in the South, perished in, in the war, either from combat um, or from disease related to combat. Um, you know, the industry of the South was famously destroyed. Sheridan said he was, he'd so destroyed the Shenandoah Valley that a crow could fly over it and not find anything to eat. So um, Robert E. Lee lost a great deal. But for him, the decision, though he said it came to him in tears of blood, um, was in other, another way very simple. Um, Robert E. Lee was tied to the founding of this country. His family had been in Virginia since the 17th century. His family was one of the leading families in the, in the state. His father had not only served under um, Washington Revolutionary War, he had been governor of the state. Um, so, and as I mentioned before, he was married into Washington's family. So, Robert E. Lee had no interest in seeing this country torn asunder. But on the other hand, as an American, as a Virginian, as someone who believed in the right of people to determine their own government, he believed that Americans don't settle disputes by force. 
no matter how controversial the political issue, um, no matter how meaningful, something like slavery, um, you don't settle these disputes at the point of a gun. Um, he said, and this is a quote from Lee, that a uh, union that can only be maintained by swords and bayonets has no charm for me. He also paid the price in his career. He was a stellar officer and during the Mexican War. Um, Winfield Scott, then commander of all U.S. forces, thought that Robert E. Lee was the finest officer he had ever seen in the field. And he worked Robert E. Lee practically to death. He kept him in the, on horseback doing everything for days at a time. Until Lee, at one point, actually received a flesh wound and collapsed. He was so exhausted. But at the outbreak of the war between the states, Lee was offered command of the Union Army. He was offered every uh, professional ambition he could have ever wanted. And he turned it down. And he turned it down saying that though opposed to secession, he could not consent to raise his hand against his family, his friends, his native state. Um, he would return to Virginia and share um, whatever Virginia was going to suffer. And save in defense of Virginia, he would raise his sword against no one. Um, I mentioned in the book that you know today, taking the side of the Confederacy is a very um, controversial thing, but it obviously is even more controversial back then, and more than political correctness was at stake. Men's lives were at stake. The future of the Union was at stake. The future of a new potential independent Southern Confederacy was at stake. Um, and I, you know, in an odd way, I think that um, Robert E. Lee's position is more understandable if we approach it with an open mind to contemporary Americans than would be um, say Lincoln's position. How many of us would wish to settle a dispute amongst our fellow Americans by force of arms? I mean, if some other controversial were to, issue were to come up today, say the, the states of the Southern Confederacy wanted to secede so that they could act, enact um, pro-life legislation that the, federal, um, that the Supreme Court didn't think was constitutionally justified, would we think it proper to send armored divisions across the 14th Street Bridge here in Washington, carpet bomb southern cities, and blockade southern ports to settle this dispute. You know, I tend to think that would be sort of the lunatic fringe would be advocating that. I, um, Lee was standing with the right of a people to determine their own destiny. In 1861, when the Civil War started, and anybody that's come to this town knows right over there across the river is Arlington House, Custis Lee Mansion. Did he live there? Yes, he did. Um, in fact, it was the closest thing the Lees had. He was in the Army, so he was traveling a lot. But it was the closest thing they had to a family home. They lived there for and there was no time. Arlington National Cemetery then? No. Um, Ar Arlington House, being just across the Potomac River, was occupied by federal forces shortly after hostilities broke out. And um, Lee was never allowed to return. It was turned into an, a national cemetery, um, partly as punishment for the Lees, obviously. Um, but it also is part of the tragedy of his life and his family that um, they lost uh, some of uh, Washington's heirlooms there, which had been passed down th through his wife. Some were actually stolen, others were just um, taken by the federal government. How much of a Washington was his wife? She was, if I remember rightly, his great-granddaughter. It's a little bit confusing the way these lines work. She was the daughter of Washington Custis, who was Washington's adopted grandson. Um, so it's through the, um, the mother's line. How did it work at the, you know, when Winfield Scott offered him the job of running the Union Army, how did it work? I mean, did he call him from over at the Arlington House over here somewhere in the district? And uh, it, it wasn't actually Winfield Scott who made the offer. Winfield Scott greeted him right after he made the offer. And when Lee, um, Lee told him of what he decided, Winfield Scott said, uh, uh, Lee, you've made the worst decision of your life but I feared it would be so. And then he turned around and told his uh, colleagues in um, federal service that the addition of Robert E. Lee to, to the Confederacy was going to be worth at least 50,000 men to the Southern cause. Who did they offer that job to then once he said he wasn't going to take it? Well, the job eventually fell to um, George McClellan, who was uh, Lee's first um, the first Union general he faced head-on in Virginia. Did they know each other at West Point or any place like that? No. Um, the uh, McClellan, well, McCle McClellan was actually a roommate of A.P. Hill, who was another Confederate officer um, in Virginia. But um, they, they knew each other, but they were not 
close friends. Who did Robert E. Lee know on the other side? Well, he, he knew many of the officers as a career officer, but um, I don't think any of them were really close friends. It's an odd thing about Robert E. Lee. Actually, most of his closest friends were women, um, though he um, you know, was uh, a masculine man. He, he, his friendships with men were pretty much professional, and the people he liked to socialize with were, were women. You say he didn't swear. No, I mean, this is one of the things that actually uh, initially attracted me to um, Robert E. Lee, was here was this man who combined the most daring battlefield maneuvers, who was an audacious and aggressive military commander, taking huge risks and uh, always seeking to take the offensive whenever he could. But in his personal conduct with people, he was incredibly gentle. He operated by suggestion rather than direct order, if he could. Um, and actually, this is uh, one of the leadership principles I... I try to draw out of the book, is that Robert E. Lee um, was a man who believed in self-control. And one of his famous dictums about leadership was, I cannot consent to put under the control... Er, a man who cannot control himself is someone I will not give control of others, or words to that effect. Um, because he believed that men's passions blinded their logic. They blinded their um, ability to make the proper decision. Um, Robert E. Lee was very respectful both of his superiors and of his subordinates. Let me ask you about, because you talk about Lee's lessons in all of your chapters, how did you decide to do this? And how many of them are there? Do you know? Did you ever count them up? Um, I, I actually never did count them up, and there's not a set number per chapter. Um, it, this book is actually um, the third in a series that the, the publishing company, Prima Publishing, has done. The first was Churchill on Leadership, the second was Reagan on leadership, and then they um, had me do Lee on leadership, and that was part of the format that they uh, that they had adopted. I think it's actually very useful. Um, uh, not always, but sometimes the uh, bulleted points at the back are direct quotes from Robert E. Lee, and other times are just um, things you can easily extrapolate from what you've just read. What do you do um, on your day job? Well, in my day job, I work with books. Actually, I'm a book editor. I um, acquire books and knock books into shape, work with authors on books for a, a company here in town called Regnery Publishing. How long have you done that? Uh, off and on for probably um, close to a decade. I, this is my second tour with Regnery. I went off and did some political speech writing in between. Who did you work for? Uh, governor of California. Which governor? Uh, Pete Wilson. And w do you remember the moment when this book became a project for you? How did it happen? It happened, I uh, actually signed the contract, uh, let's see, April of 98. Um, it, it happened actually very quickly. I mean, most, uh, the book industry generally works very slowly, and you go through this arduous process of doing a long proposal and talking to people about it. Um, it's a tribute to the uh, to Prima Publishing that I actually did it on the basis of a one-page fax. <laughs> I actually thought the idea was just so obviously um, a good one that I just stated my qualifications to write the book and said, here are the sort of things I'd like to cover, and they took a flyer on me. Why did they think of you? Um, I don't know. Uh, I can only assume it's because uh, I'd done writing before. They knew I was a qualified uh, uh, author in that regard, and I just uh, had a great interest in the subject. Have you ever written a book before? Uh, not under my own name. I've, um, uh, and I, I've helped authors assemble books and rewrite books um, a lot. Where did you grow up? San Diego, uh, California. Actually, my mother's side, I'm something unheard of, like a fifth or sixth generation Californian. Um, but uh, I moved out here uh, after college. Where'd you go to school? Um, UC San Diego for my undergraduate work, and then went to England for two years, um, where I got a degree through the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, though I've never been to the LA campus. I did all my coursework and everything else in, in London. And your name is H.W. Crocker III. Right. What's H.W. stand for? Harry William. Why do you use the initials? Uh, I've done a lot of uh, freelance writing and book reviewing um, in my day, and that's just how I started off doing it. I don't, I don't particularly know why. I, I get perhaps just to distinguish myself from my father um, and uh, just sort of stuck with it. Who is H.W. Crocker II? He, uh, he's a retired school teacher out in, uh, out in California. What your mom do? She was a school teacher too, but she retired uh, 
as soon as I was born. How did you get interested in writing? Uh, that was just uh, innate. I, I've always been interested in books and writing and reading and history and, and military subjects. And then when you had this assignment, how did you get ready to write? Uh, I'd done a lot of reading beforehand. Um, but uh, once it was now totally official, the, the ink was dry on the contract, I did, I did put myself through another crash course reviewing a lot of the books and whatnot. Um, I hoped initially to do a lot of the writing early in the morning or at night, but between the demands of job and family, that really proved more or less impracticable. So I, uh, I ended up really blocking off every weekend I could, which was m virtually all of them, and putting in very long hours on the weekend. Um, and I'm proud to say I turned the book in before my deadline. <laughs> how, may, how humble was Robert E. Lee? You talk about his humility. Uh, he was a very humble man. He was completely devoid. People noticed this, too. This wasn't just, just my um, spin on him. Um, people noticed that he was... Ego was something that was absent from his character. Um, fame didn't spoil him. And uh, he just... It, it was part of this innate sort of um, Christian... He, he embodied many Christian paradoxes. Among them were to lead is to serve. He never thought that being a leader... Were, meant that he had any claims over other people. He, meant, he thought that being a leader meant he was there to serve other people, to make them succeed. Um, another um, officer, one of his staff officers, Walter Taylor, who observed him, said that um, Lee conducted his affairs of business as a general, when he was doing all his paperwork and making dispositions and whatnot, as though he were beholden for everything he did to a higher power. I think this is another sort of crucial thing about Lee. Another, um, in fact, a British observer, a, a field marshal named Garnet Wolseley, said that um, Lee was quick in decision, yet methodical in all he did. And I think this sort of combination of being able to make quick decisions, but also taking due care for details, knowing that you're responsible for everything, um, and not seeking, as you're drawing up these plans, to find any... You know, those, from the movie Patton, some of us get this idea of these flamboyant generals like Montgomery and Patton who are each trying to outdo the other. And, um, Lee didn't think in those terms at all. The idea was to win the objective. He didn't really care who got the, the credit. Uh, where was he born? Lee was born in Virginia. Where? At a place called Stratford Hall, which is um, down in the northern neck of Virginia. Have you been there? Yeah, it's a beautiful place. Um, Stratford Hall was actually lost to the family, <laughs> to the Lee family, uh, well, uh, shortly after he was born. Uh, his father um, was a very swashbuckling character, but sort of a near-do-well, who um, he and uh, actually Lee's half-brother um, went through a series of financial and other scandals. Father's like, Light Horse Harry? Light Horse Harry, and the half-brother was known as Black Horse Harry because of some of the scandals he got involved with. Where did Light Horse get his first name or his nickname? Uh, that was as an officer, as a cavalry officer. Uh, he, was, he was Henry Lee, officially, but he became Light Horse Harry Lee because he was just the sort of um, dashing man on sword and horseback. So what kind of a world was Robert E. Lee born into down at Stratford Hall? And he was born into a world of both grace, and they were very gentle people. Um, his mother's side was also very well-to-do, famous Virginia family, the Carters. Um, but to trouble, because his father sort of squandered the family fortunes. And um, I mentioned in the book that in some ways, Robert Lee had a contemporary upbringing. He was brought up by what we would call today a, a single mother. Uh, his father uh, left the family when Lee was six years old. It was the last time Lee saw his father. His father went to the Caribbean to try to restore both his health. He'd had some bad health problems and his finances. Um, and so though his mother had been born to these vast estates, they lived in a fairly humble home in Alexandria, Virginia. And um, he, uh, from an early age, he, he learned frugality, he learned dutifulness, and all the sort of, you know, Boy Scout virtues. Um, but it's remarkable that uh, none of this ever compromised Lee's sense of humor or his sort of warm-heartedness. He was very... Um, um, dutiful, but he was also very, um, people just innately respected him and liked him and looked up to his character as, as a perfect thing. He was known as the Marble Man, not because he was cold, but because he seemed perfect. Um, he graduated from West Point without a single demerit, without a single black mark, 
on his, um, his character, uh, part of his report card, second academically in his class. Um, and uh, he was built, as I, as I mentioned in the book, sort of like an inverted pyramid. He, he was physically imposing, a very big chest and shoulders, but which tapered down on a thin waist and very small feet. He actually had size four and a half shoes. Um, so, on horseback, he looked great. Must look kind of odd, though, on those small feet on, on the ground. Now, Stratford Hall is how far from Alexandria? Uh, well, nowadays, probably by car, it may be um, an hour and a half, two hours. Why did they come north to Alexandria? Why did his mother come north? Uh, there were familial connections. The, it, Lees and um, Carters were all over the state and um, ended up settling in, in Alexandria. What year was he born in? 1807. And when did they move to Alexandria? Uh, it was in his boyhood. I, I can't remember the exact date. What years did he go to West Point? That would be, let me think, the 1820s. Um, he went back and became superintendent of West Point uh, I think in the 1840s, uh, late 1840s. I can't really recall. How did he get his original appointment to West Point? Uh, it was it done the usual. He applied, and he was recommended by all the political figures who had to take care of it. And it was uh, it was not a hard thing. He prepped for it. He went, did some in, um, intensive uh, tutoring, but um, he, he 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 was academically sound. He had all the right uh, credentials. When did he marry? He married young. Um, he married uh, shortly after he um, graduated from West Point. Um, the, w one interesting thing about his marriage is that um, he, his, his wife began developing health problems at a fairly young age, in her late 20s. She was crippled virtually by arthritis by the time she was in her 40s. And um, she nevertheless bore Lee seven children, and he was completely uh, devoted to her, uh, and, but they were, they were a study in contrast. Where Lee was prompt, she was always late. Where he was handsome, she was rather plain. Where he was neat, she was messy. Um, where he had, was a man of tremendous self-control, she was kind of a free spirit and spoke her mind. And um, She also liked living in house. She liked living in luxury. Well, um, Lee was uh, less concerned with those sort of things. You, uh, I counted five children you talked about in the book. Rob, Rooney, Custis, Mildred, and Annie. Mm -hmm. There are two other daughters. Did they live, or you? Um, all of the children lived, save for one, who um, died. She had a, a fever during the war. And you say that a couple of his sons. Uh, well, for instance, Rooney was a prisoner of war during the uh, right war. And before you answer that, I just almost said it myself. I almost said Civil War. You never refer to the Civil War. You always refer to the war between the states. Right. I do that out of deference to. Um, to my southern friends. I mean, I think they make a good point. The Civil War is sort of what you would see in um, Romania, Yugoslavia. It's an insurrection within defined borders. Um, this is really a separation between two, which certainly thought of themselves, but uh, two distinct regions. Um, so it was a war between self-defined, at least. I mean, the South thought of it as an independent nation rather than an internal conflict. It wasn't a struggle for power. Um, Within a, within the same country, you uh, write a lot about the battles of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Did you go to these places? Been to most all of them. Um, it, which uh, in living in Virginia is an easy thing to do. I mean, most of them are, you know, two, three at the most, four hours away from Northern Virginia, and some of them are uh, very, very close indeed. This last weekend, I was just up at uh, Antietam and Harper's Ferry again, and the weekend before that, I was in Gettysburg and. So they're easy to get to. Well, let me just ask, for those who have never been there, Antietam is how far from here? Uh, maybe an hour and a half. Harpers Sharpsburg, Maryland. Right, yeah. Harpers Ferry is about an hour. Gettysburg? An hour and a half, two hours. And one that you write about, and I want you to talk about Chancellorsville and Stonewall Jackson. How far is that from here? Uh, probably about two hours. In Virginia? Yeah. yeah. What happened at Chancellorsville, and when did it happen? Chancellorsville uh, is probably the most stunning Confederate um, victory in the war. Uh, I think in the book I call it um, the high tide of Lee's Confederacy. The high tide of the Confederacy is generally regarded as Gettysburg, it's the farthest north the Army of Virginia ever got. But, um, but Chancellorsville is stunning because um, 
Lee was outnumbered roughly three to one. He had federal troops coming at him from two directions, from Fredericksburg to the east and um, at Chancellorsville to the west. They were led by a Union officer who was known as a, a braggart and uh, a man who liked his liquor, <laughs> named uh, Joseph Hooker, who was convinced he was going to crush the, um, the, uh, the Confederate Army. And by the way, Hooker is uh, where they got the name Hooker for prostitute? Yes. Uh, Why was that? Do you remember? Uh, it happened, it's some incident here in Washington, D.C., but I don't remember the, the details. Um, maybe he was charged with rounding them up at one point or something, I, I can't recall. What year was Chancellorsville? Um, it's, um, I can put it on the spot. I, I can remember. look it up. Go ahead. I mean, it was early in the war, though. Or, it, well, like, it's, kind of mid, it's middle of the war. I mean, it's not late. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's before Gettysburg. Um, the, uh, the stunning thing about Chancellorsville, though, is what Stonewall Jackson does under um, Lee's direction. Lee, outnumbered now on, on two sides, is trying to find a way to, in his words, get at those people. And getting at those people is one of his constant things. He never liked to be static on the defensive. Um, and um, he sent Stonewall Jackson out on a reconnaissance to find out if there's a way to get around the Union flank. Who was Stonewall Jackson at that moment? And Tell us something about him. Stonewall Jackson was a man who actually, his genius was discovered by Lee. When Lee was still um, a uh, desk officer, as he was at the beginning of the war, he was a, a sort of Jefferson Davis's troubleshooter in Richmond. And Lee saw this man in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia who was conducting all these independent operations that were stunning and befuddling Union forces, um, much his superior in numbers, and was doing this largely on his own hook. Uh, and Lee liked men like that. He liked men who could take the initiative. Um, so Lee captured him, brought him back um, with the Army of Northern Virginia, and uh, they had the greatest partnership of any two generals of the war. Um, Stonewall Jackson was in many ways an odd man. He was um, very, um, he, he, he was known for being very dour, but there were actually many winsome, um, sweet things about him. He had been a professor at um, the Virginia Military Institute, He'd been a soldier before that. He'd gone to West Point. Uh, served bravely in the Mexican War. And um, he was known as an eccentric, though. He was an extremely devout Presbyterian, um, Sabbatarian, didn't like fighting on Sunday, didn't even really draw ammunition on Sunday if he could avoid it. Um, and uh, was very uncommunicative with his, um, not only with his troops, with his fellow officers. He never liked to tell them when they, where they were going because he, he liked the idea of secrecy. How old was he when he was doing this? He was in his 30s. Most of these men are also, they're very young. As um, generals? Yeah. Um, uh, the youngest, um, I maybe mean, not the youngest general, the youngest general is probably um, Custer on the Union side, but a lot of these men, Lee is a little bit of the exception, being a, a bit older, but men like Jeb Stewart and A.P. Hill. Jeb Stewart is really more a striking example on the Confederate side. They're all, they're all fairly young men, given huge responsibility. Um, but anyway, at, at uh, Chancellorsville, it was um, Jackson who comes back to Lee and just around the campfire and says, I intend to go around their flank this way. I found this road. We can do it. And he says, well, how many men do you take, intend to take with you? And he intends to take roughly two-thirds of Lee's men, leaving Lee to face the front of Hooker's forces with you know, a, a holding force that wouldn't have held them for 20 minutes. Um, but Lee, you know, joyously endorsed this and said, well, go on then. And that sort of calm, <laughs> trusting to a daring subordinate is also a hallmark of Lee. And it, it, it's a hallmark of Lee's for a couple of reasons. One is he very much trusted Jackson. He believed in people. He didn't believe in numbers. Um, and when, when Lee first took battlefield command, which was during the um, Seven Days campaign in front of Richmond early in the war, the, um, the Confederate troops up to that point had been continually retreating, trying to find a good defense position. They'd finally stopped within sight of Richmond, the capital of, of Virginia and the capital of the Confederacy. And um, when Lee called his first staff meeting, the, um, he wanted to know what the generals thought they should do. And they thought they should retreat further, and they were doing all these calculations. And he said, you know, stop figuring. If you keep ciphering, we're beat before we even get started. Um, so he didn't believe in numbers. He didn't believe in sort of textbook strategy. He believed to find the right man for the right job. You want him to be audacious and daring, and you turn him loose. 
Um, and that's what he did with Jackson. And Jackson responded well to that sort of um, independent command. How was he killed? He was killed, unfortunately, by friendly fire. Um, and he was out riding in front of his troops. The, the Jackson's movement at Chancellorsville starts about 5.15, if I remember rightly, in the evening. So they, don't, they didn't have much time. Darkness is falling. And once they had the Union forces routed, they wanted to keep them going. This is one of Jackson's stratagems, was that once you have uh, your enemy flustered on the run, don't let up. Keep after them. And he wanted to keep after them even after darkness was falling. And he was looking out uh, on a scouting expedition um, to find ways to keep the offensive rolling. As he was riding back, um, he was actually shot down. He was mistaken for, for federal cavalry. How did he lose his arm? And uh, I understand that the arm is buried one place and he's buried another? Right. <laughs> the, um, uh, the wounds that went into him went into his arm. The arm was amputated. Um, he died later of pneumonia. And uh, in fact, you can go visit the, the little house where he died. It's in a place called uh, Guinea Station uh, off the main interstate here in Virginia, um, 95. And the uh, one striking thing, I think, for visitors who want to go find that place is that the freeway signs that direct you there are to the Stonewall Jackson Shrine. Um, and to go off the Stonewall Jackson Shrine, you go off, um, off through and off this, what eventually becomes a little dirt road. Um, and it really is kind of like a shrine because there's nothing hyped about it. You go in there, and the only thing that's there is the room and a r ranger who will tell you about the, what happened there, but there's no gift shop and there's no ticky-tacky stuff. It's, um, it's all very sober. Um, so much Jackson died on the Sabbath, as he wished to do. It was kind of a long-term wish of his. And um, before Lee... Um, this was a devastating blow for Lee. Um, there was a famous quote where um, Lee said, Jackson has lost his left arm, but I have lost my right. And um, it was recorded by some that Lee, who was known as a religious man, never prayed harder than when he um, prayed that Stonewall Jackson might recover. And even Jefferson Davis, who was slow to see Jackson's gifts and who in any event was a man of fairly stoic demeanor, when um, someone went to go see him shortly after Jackson's funeral, they saw him staring off into space. And uh, you know, said, what's the matter, Mr. President? And he said, uh, I'm just trying to recover from a stunning blow. Um, you know, there are many Confederates after the war, um, in fact, there's uh, one um, person who says that Lee actually said this, that if Stonewall Jackson had been with Robert E. Lee at Gettysburg, that battle might have gone another way. He says, at the Battle of Gettysburg, Lee's, Lee wanted the same sort of independent operations he saw at Chancellorsville and couldn't get them done. In 1861, Civil War starts. How many men are there under arms in the North and in the South? I don't remember the exact numbers, but the um, differentials between the two are on the basis of two to one. Um, but the South was taking a much larger section of its draft age population, putting them under arms. The North had, in a sense, a bit cavalier, but they really had endless supplies of men. During the um, 1864 campaign, when Grant takes command against, um, against Lee, Grant is losing casualties at the rate of two to one for everyone. Every, every Confederate he's able to kill of Robert E. Lee's, he's losing two men. Um, but he's able to do this. He's able to win this endless war of attrition because Lee's resources are more or less static. When these men are gone, they're not replaceable. Well, let me ask you this. If Robert E. Lee had had the same number of men that the North had, what would have happened? It would have been an entirely different uh, game. Was it a war of attrition then? Uh, no, no. But, uh, Lee didn't believe in wars of attrition. Lee would have... If, if Grant? Lee, yes. Yes. I mean, Lee, uh, Grant believed that the, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ground this guy into powder. And essentially that's what happened. Le Grant didn't succeed in beating Lee in any of these battles leading down to the Siege of Petersburg. The Siege of Petersburg goes on for eight or nine months. And what year was that? that well, it ends up in 1865, where um, the war actually ends in uh, April 1865, um, where Lee is finally forced to abandon Petersburg. But all the way up to then, Grant has just been pounding Lee, but not ever defeating him. What were the major battles that you write about that Robert E. Lee was involved in? Uh, he wasn't actually 
in command at the Battle, the battle of First Manassas, but he had helped drop the strategy for the first Confederate victory. Um, the Battle of Second Manassas, Battle of Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, um, the 1864 campaign, which encompasses many battles, and the sort of... The wilderness, was that in there? The wilderness, uh, Cold Harbor. Um, Did he lose? Did Lee lose any of those? No. Um, all of them are, at a minimum, tactical victories. Some of them actually were pretty stunning victories. It was at the Battle of um, Cold Harbor that... Um, Where is that? Movie? It's... Uh, east of Richmond, um, that Grant had thrown so many troops in the sort of ceaseless assault that kept failing that uh, federal officers thought they would not be able to order their men forward again. The army was so demoralized. Um, Grant himself was supposedly um, just shocked and stunned at what was going on. Did Robert E. Lee have slaves? Yes, but for a very short period of time. When and, not, and by the standards of plantation owners, he didn't have very many slaves. He, had, he inherited slaves when he inherited Arlington House. Uh, Washington Custis, his uh, father-in-law, had a plantation at Arlington. Um, and it was an interesting plantation, though, because Washington Custis not only didn't like to work himself, he didn't like to see other people work. He was a very lazy man. And uh, the, when he, um, in, in the terms of his will, he mandated that the slaves be freed within five years of the wills taking effect. So um, Robert E. Lee did free all the slaves for which he was responsible. The slaves were all freed before the Emancipation Proclamation became law. In 63? In 63, right. Um, and he made an extraordinary effort to make sure that every slave which he was responsible found employment afterwards. Um, now the, Slavery does touch Robert Lee in other parts of his life up then, um, but in you know, very minuscule ways. The, the family, the Lee family, had maybe half a dozen slaves, um, but Lee really had nothing to do with them. He inherited, I believe, four slaves from his mother, but he got rid of them almost as soon as they officially came into his possession. And early in his career, he was um, given an, uh, an old man to go take with him as sort of a servant down to uh, one of his early commands, I believe in Georgia. But they were really sort of one-off things. And, uh, by the standard, he, he wasn't a planter, he was a soldier. This is way out of context, but at the end of the war, you tell a story about a church service in Richmond. Right. And a I black man. Yeah, it's one of, uh, it's a great Robert E. Lee story, because it says uh, a lot about him. The um, war is just over. He's in Richmond, a place called St. Peter's Church, uh, upper class, then white. Um, Episcopal Church and um, during the service a black man went up to the uh, chancel rail to receive communion this had never happened before and the congregation was all rather embarrassed shuffling in their seats even the priest didn't know what to do and it was Robert E. Lee who took the initiative and went up and knelt beside the black man at the chancel rail and would never said a word but through this act um, made this obvious public gesture that what matters is we're all Virginians, we're all Episcopalians, and now we're all Americans again. And um, after the war, Robert, Robert E. Lee was opposed to continuing any sort of dissension. Um, he believed the cause he felt for was just and right, but he also believed it had been settled on the, on the battlefield. What was his cause? His cause was um, the cause of constitutional government um, and the cause of people being allowed to determine their own destiny. Um, when, when, this, when the Confederacy gets um, hit with these charges of being a, a uh, when its distinguishing feature is identified as slavery, I really think that's unjust, because that's only true if America's distinguishing feature was slavery before the war. I mean, the South, at the outbreak of hostilities and civil war, is um, only upholding the status quo and upholding rulings of the Supreme Court on the issue of slavery. Slavery does not, the ending of slavery does not become a Union war aim until after the Battle of Sharpsburg in 1862, when, um, when, Lee, or, uh, when Lincoln announces the Emancipation Proclamation, which becomes law in 1863. But even Lincoln um, admitted that this was a, um, it really had no binding legal force. A president just can't announce a law. I mean, this was not a law that, uh, uh, it, 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 was, it was a war aim. It was, it was it applied only to those states 
not even those states, those areas that were in rebellion against the Union. Border states like Maryland, um, Kentucky, Missouri, um, which were not part of the Confederacy, um, were not affected, nor were um, places that had been occupied by federal forces early in the war, where, where slavery existed. Slavery was not abolished there. It was targeted only on those areas that were, that were in rebellion against the Union. This is a quote, uh, you've got Robert E. Lee saying this, let him never touch a novel. They print beauty more charming than nature and describe happiness that never exists. They will teach him to sigh after that which has no reality, to despise the little good that is granted us in this world and to expect more than is given. Speaking to Rooney, his son, what's that about? It's a very Robert e. Lee sentiment, actually, and Lee believed in taking reality for what it was. He believed, as I say in the book, in the religion of things as they are. He thought that nothing, or few things, contribute more to human unhappiness than the sort of hearkening after things that can never be. Um, Lee believed in you take circumstances and you make the, the most of them. If you daydream about these you know, fantastical things you could do for yourself, you won't be able to appreciate, as he says there, the, the little mercies, the glories of nature that we are granted in. It's, it's a Christian uh, vision, sort of veil of tears that we you, go through. You also write this, you say that in any event, these are your words, in any event, today our hopes for producing men like America's Virginia-born founding fathers are about as distant as our hopes of hearing news of rising SAT scores, the growing unpopularity of television, and the demise of rock music. It is true that Lee comes from this um, tradition within Virginia. I mean, he's a, a son of one of the men who served the founders. It's a Virginia that produced Washington, Madison, Monroe, um, and even among the Confederate officers, these are remarkable men, men like A.P. Hill and Stonewall Jackson and, um, and Lee. Um, we don't, we often now, it's kind of a cliche, people say, where are our Washingtons today? Where are our Lincolns today? Uh, where are our Jeffersons today? Um, and uh, we don't seem to have them. I, I argue in the book that it's partly because we've misunderstood what it means to be a leader. I think all too often now people think that to be a leader it means that you take names and you kick butts and you... Um, it becomes a sort of self-fulfillment driven vocation. And Lee believed that was not true. Um, that, uh, in fact, there's a famous incident in Lee, Lee's life after the war where a woman holds up her young son to Robert E. Lee and says, General Lee, what should I teach my son? What's the most important lesson I can teach him? And he says, teach him he must deny himself. And that was really one of the bywords of Robert E. Lee's life, was teach him he must deny himself. And on top of that, um, Lee believed, and this again ties into what the cause he fought for during the war, he believed in a gentleman and a leader is best graded by the avoidance of the use of force. The more you lead by example, um, the, the more qualified you are to be a leader. And he believed in conscience. He believed in freedom of conscience. Even during, after he made his decision to cast his lot with the um, Confederacy, he makes this um, somewhat startling um, comment to his wife. He says that um, if I have done wrong, let him, that is his sons, do better. He didn't want his sons guided by his example in making this controversial decision. As it turned out, they all entered Confederate service. But he believed that individual conscience or conscience was, uh, was, was important. Um, it, it, it sounds, again, kind of cliche, but he, uh, he told his children as he was raising them that the most important thing they could do was to always abide by the dictates of conscience. And the decisions you make on that basis may not be pleasurable or profitable even in the way we consider these things but you would have this one great consolation that if you do what you think is right and you if you exert every sinew that you have in your body to execute that duty you'll have no cause to ever doubt yourself no matter what happens and this was true for Lee throughout the war he trusted the providence also after the war um, he, he said you know I may not understand why our cause was doomed I'm paraphrasing here but, uh, but uh, you know, we, ha we have to trust to a merciful providence that all things will be turned to, to right. Uh, how many of his children fought in the war? His three sons were all... Um, Any of them wounded? Yes. Um, 
Rooney was wounded. He was the one who became the prisoner of war. He also had a nephew, Fitzhugh Lee, who actually took command after um, Jeb Stewart uh, died. His son, Robert E. Lee um, Jr., uh, I don't believe he was wounded, but there's a great uh, anecdote about him, which is at the Battle of uh, Sharpsburg, if I remember rightly, where... Um, Antietam. Uh, or Antietam, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, the, uh, Lee rides up to this uh, uh, artillery piece, and is uh, ordering it back into action after the pieces actually have been destroyed. And he sees this man covered in, in um, ashes and dirt and gunpowder, and it's his son. <laughs> and his son says, you know, are you going to order us back into that, uh, in that fighting? And, and um, Lee kind of cracks his grin and says, yes, you must go back and do all you can to keep those people back. Was he wounded? I don't think so. I think uh, he ended the war pretty much unscathed. When did he develop a heart problem? Um, oh, you mean Lee himself? He, yes. he, he was wounded not by gunfire. He, he did injure himself in a, a horse accident um, in the war. He developed heart problems at least during the war. It's hard to trace these things back, but the, certainly the symptoms start hitting him during the war. During the Battle of Gettysburg, he was famously um, not feeling up to par. And as the war dragged on, it was obviously becoming more and more painful. It became hard for him to move. He was becoming, his breath was, um, was leaving him. And his features were becoming, he aged rapidly during the war. In fact, when he was going to take his um, first position after the war at as president of this college, when it was offered to him, he said, you know, I've got to tell you, I don't think I have the, the strength to do much teaching. I think I can handle the, administra the administrative role, but uh, I'm not the man I used to be. How old is he in this picture? That picture is, he's probably around, um, do some quick math, but 58. Uh, that's a famous Matthew Brady picture taken um, just after the war. Inside the book, um, oh, by the way, uh, in any battle, where would you find him? Well, especially towards the uh, latter part, at the front, um, Lee... Walking? No, no, on, on horseback. Um, he, he would ride to the front and be, be with his men. Um, what was the name of his horse? Traveler. He had, he had several horses, but his favorite mount, and his most famous mount, was, was Traveler. In fact, he became so attached to Traveler that he said he didn't think he could have endured what he'd had to go through in the war unless he'd been able to ride out in the countryside, as he always tried to do, half hour a day or so, on Traveler. Two of them sort of uh, communed. Where's Traveler today? Traveler is actually buried in Lexington, Virginia, just outside of Lee Chapel um, in Lexington. Um, Le Lexington, Virginia, actually, if, if anyone comes out this way to visit, is a great, great place. It's, it's where Stonewall Jackson taught and is buried. His horse is buried there on the grounds of VMI, the Virginia Military Institute. What was his horse's name? Little Sorrel. And um, there's Washington Lee University with Lee Chapel and the burial spot of Traveler. And, VMI, Virginia Military Institute, right and next door to each other. Right next, I mean, literally right next right. door to each other. What, is there any symbolism there, or why are they together that close? Um, I think it's just chance. It just they've developed that way. Both schools were badly um, damaged, destroyed during the war, um, and it was one of Lee's first projects to um, to really restore what was, again what was in Washington College. You say um, in your book about leadership that one of the things that Lee lived by was do your own reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. I mean, all your, I don't know how many you've got of these leadership tips in here, are they supposed to be leadership of anything? Yeah, I mean, I think something like that is something that could be um, adapted to, uh, to business pretty easily. I mean, to go out and get the details about the, uh, what affects your marketplace yourself. Don't necessarily trust on other people to filter the information for you. And go out and mix it up with the people out in the field. Yeah, I had to read a bunch of these because uh, we've been talking about them and I haven't literally stated them. A leader must keep hope alive. A leader must recognize that in the end there are those things worse than even defeat when facts dictate that one's business has failed and that one's war is lost and that no further effort could possibly achieve success. A leader knows it is far better to face facts squarely than to carry on a struggle that results only in needless effusions of red ink or red blood. Actually, two of those points have very interesting stories connected to them. Um, on Do Your Own Reconnaissance, there's a famous and somewhat humorous incident in the Mexican War where Lee was out doing reconnaissance and his uh, Mexican guide pointed to these, uh, what appeared to be, white tents 
and campfires in the distance and said, there's the Mexican army, we've got to get out of here. And uh, Lee didn't take his word for it, and, well, his guide ran away. He rode on into the darkness to get a better, closer look. And as he rode up closer, he discovered that those white tents were actually white sheep. And the fires were the fires of the shepherds who were taking care of them. And through the shepherds, he found out where the Mexican army um, uh, actually was. And on the story of sometimes uh, um, defeat has to be faced squarely, there's actually a very moving story connected with that, which is that shortly before Lee rode into Appomattox uh, Courthouse to surrender to Grant, he was talking to one of his young artillery officers, a man named Alexander, and talking about what they should do. He always he he liked to talk, even though he generally knew what he wanted to do, he would talk it through with his officers to go through the different scenarios. And um, Alexander, being a high-spirited young man, said, you know what we should do? We should go out and uh, become bushwhackers. We should wage a um, guerrilla campaign. We shouldn't give up. And uh, Lee said, that might be very well for, for you and for me, for, for whom uh, surrender is hateful. It might be uh, something we'd like to do for our own personal honor. But we can't think of ourselves first. We've already seen reprisals against civilians. We've already seen Sherman burning down southern cities and uh, destroying southern property. Um, this will only get worse. If we launch a partisan campaign, there will be reprisals against civilians. We have to think first of the women and the children of the South. And uh, Lee believed in what, they, what the South at the time regarded as civilized warfare. You only fight against uniformed armed men. And they were had been horrified by the sort of um, Union policy of total war. Uh, Quick point on Appomattox that right. you made. Where is it? It too is in Virginia. It's um, it's off the major freeways. It's maybe four hours from from here, from Washington. South of Washington. Yes, yeah, south. Yes, it's south of Richmond. It's how far from Petersburg? It's to the west of Petersburg, maybe hour and a half by car. When me. Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox uh, Courthouse, uh, what was the date? And how, how far away was it from the Lincoln assassination? It was Good Friday, 1865. Um, and uh, an interesting sidelight to, um, to the surrender is that uh, Lee was so taken by the generosity of spirit of Grant at the surrender that um, after the war, he would not allow a harsh word about Grant to be said in his presence. Um, which shows, I think, again, the spirit of Lee as being a kind, generous, forgiving man um, who, who bore no personal animosity, even against those he thought had been you know, fighting against his native soil and countrymen. If Abe Lincoln died on April the 15th, 1865, what, what was that? Just days, yeah. just a week yeah. there. Uh, more lessons. We're running out of time, unfortunately. Uh, a leader who earns the respect of his adversary can save himself battles, as Lee did after Gettysburg. A leader should always conduct himself so that he might enjoy the satisfaction that proceeds from the consciousness of duty faithfully performed. A leader seizes the opportunity of the day, carpe diem. A leader knows when to put himself on the front line to inspire his people. Anything that comes to mind as you hear those? Um, well, Lee, actually, again, towards the end of the war, he was always worried about his loss of officers. The um, casualty rate among Confederate officers was extremely high. and. Um, Lee at one, well, at a couple points actually during um, uh, the Battle of the Wilderness, in particular, was riding forward unarmed get, as the Union forces were pouring out, charging the Confederate line, as though he was going to stop them himself, and he had to be uh, grabbed and forcibly removed um, from charging of the Federal forces. And he said, "All right, I'll go back if you men will charge in there and and, uh, and stop them." And they did. On page 194 of this 248-page $22 book is uh, kind of, it, it sounds like this might be your uh, point. I'll get you to expound on it. You write, his method of leadership, meaning Robert E. Lee, was far removed from the childish ersatz challenges and rewards contemporary managers like to dangle before their employees, selecting managers of the month, gathering self-conscious team cheerleading sessions, organizing weekend whitewater rafting or mountain climbing to teach leadership and teamwork, it is hard to think of anything more removed from Lee's natural dignity and respect for his men and his officers. Is that that's where you're coming from? Yeah, I, yes, I think it's where Lee's coming from, too. I mean, Lee, a, another um, Confederate once said that the Army of Northern Virginia, which is what Lee led, um, was an uh, organization of gentlemen 
uh, that was driven to do one thing, which was to drive out Yankees. Um, and I, I think businesses need to be serious about this and realize that it, when you have employees from nine to five or nine to six or however long these people work, they can be devoted to your business. But it's not their lives. Um, they're individuals. And Lee, who always respected his subordinates and respected individuals, would, did, wouldn't believe in party games. He believed if your objectives are important enough to be organized as a business or something, that's motivation enough to succeed. You don't need to offer all these rewards. How, how did he die? Uh, he died after coming back from a vestry meeting, actually. At, uh, um, he, it, it was a cold, drizzly day. He came home and suddenly just couldn't speak. Was his wife still alive, by the way? Yes. He, um, he died before she did. He actually had sat down at the um, table to say grace, and no words would come out. He just sort of sat the ramrod straight and was just sort of frozen. Um, he, he, he didn't die immediately. There was a period where he was sort of feverish, and he actually did get his voice back a little bit. He spoke in monosyllables, and he did cry out a couple times. He called out for one of his officers, A.P. Hill. Who was dead. Who was dead already. And he, he, it is recorded in some place that his last words were, strike the tent, um, which uh, is a fitting epitaph. For what me. kind of a funeral did they have for him? It was um, a very big deal. He he had already become a. Uh, he, he was obviously a hero to Virginia and to the South. But interestingly enough, Lee, before his death, and he died only five years after the war. How old was he? He was sixty-three. Um, uh, he uh, he became a national hero. And we think of that five-year period, and after the bloodiest conflict this country has ever known by far. Um, it's usually said that if you add up all of America's wars put together, it's less than the number of men that perished in the, in the war between the states. And yet, before he died, a big New York newspaper, the New York Herald, was recommending that the Democratic Party nominate Robert E. Lee for president. Um, and this was when Robert E. Lee didn't even have his citizenship back yet. He couldn't vote. Um, so I really think that it's, it's very few people who... You know, come to blows, come to, come to warfare, who that quickly regard one of their former uh, opponents as uh, a hero. Our guest has been H.W. Crocker III. Robert E. Lee on Leadership is the name of the book, Executive Lessons in Character, Courage, and Vision by Prima Books. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.